Hi everyone, welcome to my talk on audio beach synchrony in video understanding and animation. My name is Ding Zhuyu Li. I'm a research scientist at Adobe Research. And this is a joint work with my interns Yang Zhou, Yabong Tian, and uh, my collaborators at Adobe and the external universities. So first, let me get started by sharing about my background. So I finished my PhD in computer graphics and mostly focused on physics-based sound simulation. And since joining Adobe around like two years ago, I, st I started to get interested in audiovisual content understanding and the synthesis. In this talk, I want to share my latest uh, research in these two topics. So one of them is audio-driven animation, and the second one is weekly supervised audiovisual scene parsing. And the first work is conditionally accepted to Seagrave Asia this year, and second work will be presented uh, in next week by Yapeng. So let me show a quick preview of what Make It Talk can do. Make It Talk is a deep learning method that automatically animates 2D portrait images. Given only speech as an input, we can create dynamic videos from a single static image. Our method estimates both facial expressions and head poses. We can animate artistic paintings, random sketches, 2D cartoon characters, Japanese mangas, stylized caricatures, and casual photos. So as you can see, our method takes a single audio file as input and plus a regular like, JPEG image, and we can generate a talking head animation. So there are a lot of related work in this domain, and here I'll only talk about a few that's closely related to ours. So Keras et al. and Qt Real et al. use a dense mesh parameterization as an intermediate stage, and this way they can get high fidelity facial expressions. And in our work, we use facial landmarks, and we believe using fewer and sparse representation can allow our network to capture the dynamic movements as style dependent. And the second cohort of the related work focused on lip synchronization. And now in our work, we argue that to generate a realistic talking head animation, the head movement and the stylized movement is also critical. So we look beyond just lip region and uh, the whole face and even the head movement is predicted using our uh, model. So here is an overview of our project. So this might get a little bit uh, complicated at first look, but essentially there are two key ideas in our paper. So first is we use the face landmark as an intermediate representation, like you see here. And second, we borrow ideas from the voice conversion literature to enable this, what we call speaker aware animation. And now I'm gonna break it down and, and show you how we implement this in our pipeline. So for the voice conversion, unlike existing work where like simple SCFT or MFCC signal is usually used to drive the animation, we first put into a voice conversion module so that to separate the embedding into two branches. One we call content embedding, the other one is speaker identity embedding. These are standard terminology from voice conversion literature. And then next, we would use the content embedding to drive what we call speech content branch. And this is to generate a more universal like mouse region movement, very similar to uh, related work. So here is an illustration. So to pre our method takes this input landmark as the base, base face configuration, and we predict the displacement, and that generates the final animation. And the bottom branch takes the speaker identity embedding, predict from the voice conversion module, and add the speaker awareness. This usually um, indicates, like it's shown here, not just the lip reaching anymore, the nose might move, the head motion might move, and so this is to capture the stylized parts, like shown here. So suppose we have two speakers. Speaker one has more like static ones. So when this one speaks, mostly just the, the leap is moving. And given speaker two, which has more active dynamics, so we can see the head has a more drastic movement. And that's what we're trying to capture with the speaker aware displacement. So going back to this, this plot, so the third part is the stylized part. It combined with the content branch and the base animation. The two displacements added together formulates the final animation. 
And then once we have the face landmarks, we then apply various techniques to drive the single image animation. So for now, for the realistic images, we use a simple triangular morphing. So here it shows the step-by-step -step process. So first, once we get the predicted landmarks, we apply the Delaunay triangulation on the input image. And then we use that to drive this kind of 2D kind of flat shaded cartoons. And for the lower branch, where we have the, for the realistic images, we use a modified version based on Zarkrof. And for more details, please see our paper. And now I'm going to show you more results. All the testing images and audios are different from the ones we used in training. Well, of course he will. The Trials of Arabella by Brioni Tallis. Mummy, you can finally crack open the champagne. Oh my god, Nola, Nola Rice. Switching between different speakers, our method produces different animations reflecting the different speaker styles. But now that they're more rich and more powerful, they've decided that that's beneath them. You just read my diary. We now compare our method to other state-of-the-art methods for creating deepfake videos of people talking. A bit of lightness to it that, that allows you to get through it without having to break down. That type of stuff, which can be so important, it is important in, in a way. This is my reality, and this is the reality of my people for decades, for centuries. NBC Glad. Why? Fox TV Jerks Quiz PM. In our paper, we have a series of evaluations on the speaker awareness. And here, I just want to show you a quick table that we plot. So the different columns is the difference in landmark movement, the velocity movement, and head rotation and position difference. Our model achieves the lowest error um, in, this, in the metrics that can determine the speaker's style or identity. And next, I want to share about the data set that we use. So for the voice conversion, we adopt Qian et al, the VCTK data sets. And for the content animation, we use the Obama Weekly address to learn the, um, the content branch. And when we try to learn the animation, the speaker aware animation and the image to image translation, we use the voxel lab data set where we have the speaker identity and the corresponding audio and facial signals. So this project started as uh, Yang's internship project and it has a, gained a few real world impacts. So the first one is uh, last it's year hard. I presented this work at the uh, Max Nix. So Max Nix is a like worldwide conference for all the like creators. I demo an earlier version of my algorithms live to convert a painting of Van Gogh into a talking head animation. Recently, this uh, audio-driven talking head generation has shipped as part of Adobe Character Animator in public beta. So if you're interested in this feature, you can not only try with our code, but also download our latest product to give it a try. So during the course of this project, we find a few like uh, avenues for future work. The first one is right now we use the facial landmark as the representation. And it's great to capture the style as we've seen but it might, be, it might not be the best representation to capture all those fine grain features for the photorealistic synthesis, for like vector art or like flat shaded images. I think they, they work reasonably well, but for photorealistic ones, maybe we need a more fine grain representation than just simply the, the 68 landmarks that we use. The second thing is about the assumption. We assume that the speaker embedding is approximately the, the style. And but in reality, that's not true. Like I can have my voice, I can speak very happily, I can speak very uh, sadly, and the emotion is not part of our equation right now. So what's the, the better way uh, to approximate the style and how do we modify or build upon the, the speaker embedding system to achieve that? And third is the same idea, can the same idea be applied on uh, whole body animation or dance? To, to use audio to drive a rhythmic uh, movement, and that remains to be, um, and to be investigated. And now I will pause for a few seconds for you to just draw down some questions and before we shift to the, the, the second half of my presentation.
All right. The second project is called Unify Multisensory Perception, your weekly supervised audiovisual video parsing. And so I want to start with showing a, a few audiovisual events. So in each of these events, they will possibly be audio driven, possibly visual, or possibly both. And let's just watch them one by one, and that can set the stage for this uh, project. She has to does, do it when she has a frisbee. Or so in this example, we hear the speech of the the camera recorder, and but we don't don't see her. And same here with the dog. We see the dog is running around, but we don't hear anything related to to the dog. She has to does, do it when she has a frisbee. Or because the dog doesn't like bark or anything. And the second one is a lawnmower. Since it's not operating, so there's not the, the typical noise associated with it. So it's only visual event. There's no audio involved. So for this one, it's, it's an audio visual event because we see the basketball and also hear the, the, the ball bouncing off the, the board. So this one, same as last one, we hear and we see the clapping and speech. So it is an audiovisual event. And the problem audiovisual event parsing is to give a video like this, we want to parse the detail structure. And in our paper, we um, our goal is to get the second level uh, prediction. So suppose this is the basketball video that we see earlier. We only show the first two seconds, but the whole video is around 10 seconds long and we want to know in which frames we can hear the basketball and which frames we, we hear the speech and which frame we hear the dog barking and same for visual and when we take the intersection of both the audio branch and the visual branch we get the AV uh, parsing result back and the goal of our project is to given any input video we generate this, this uh, uh, predictions so the overview of our, our pipeline is we take the video frames and take the audio frames and we feed to some pre-trained networks. And this part is a hybrid um, attention network that I will talk about in a bit. And after that, we'll have a second level prediction. So suppose it's three seconds, we'll have three seconds, like three prediction for each second. So in the first second, there's a dog, second, third, same apply. And for the um, audio branch, maybe only the third frame has a barking event. So the third one will indicate barking. And remember, the thesis of our project is to conduct this weekly uh, supervised training. So we don't want our training data set to have all this second level prediction. So instead, we only ask um, the users to do this video level labeling. Therefore, we need this pooling process to pull down it. And typically, the the conventional wisdom is to use mean pooling or max pooling in this process. We propose an attentive MMIL pooling process. Here, MMIL means the multi-model, multi-instance learning problem. And after this pooling process, now we have a um, video level prediction. Then we use that to, to um, compute the loss. We collect this look, listen, and parse LLP datasets for training, we only use the video level video level labels, and for testing, we annotate the second level uh, temporal boundaries for both modalities, audio and visual, and that's only used in validation and testing. So, two of the the um, the design choice that we make in this um, the 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 first half of the network is the hybrid attention network which is basically to uh, consider temporal and the cross-model uh, synchrony and asynchrony. So in this case, if you look at the red frame, all the blue frames share a similar visual embedding. So that way we can gather the um, temporal coherence. And similarly, in the audio domain, we can also, also gather the audio branch information into consideration such that it is not isolated frame, but also gather information from neighboring audio and visual frames. And for the attentive MMIL pooling process, um, instead of mean pooling or max pooling, we also believe that the network has some confidence of what regions a certain event might happen. So in this case, if 
uh, we are interested in category C and our, um, we have two fully connected network, um, AV attention network and temporal attention network that can do a pre-filtering, have a confidence level of whether certain event is happening. And if we are certain event is not happening, we can basically uh, exclude them from the pooling process. When we conduct experiments with these two additions, we see some promising improvement, but then we quickly realize we run into an issue. And an issue that's been observed in many recent work. For example, from also from Yapeng ECCV 2018, in this audiovisual event localization, we're trying to also trying this weekly supervised learning problem. And the focus there is to, to uh, localize the event. So given the sound source, how do you localize where the sound is coming from? And on top right is the recent CVPR paper on what makes the multimodal classification network hard. And basically simple concatenate them together or just mix them together usually won't give the best result. And same here, the listen to look is trying to distill the information from visual modality to audio modality. And all of this, this project, they, they share a similar challenge, which is this modality bias. And next, I'm going to talk about what this modality bias um, I mean. So this is, a, I, I believe, this is an inherent problem with all cameras. Because in, in visual uh, sensors, it's by design, has a very limited view. Um, so we can only see what's in front of us. And, but in audio, we, it's always omnidirectional recording. Like here I show a polar pattern. This is like theoretical pattern, but in reality, like in our smartphone or the mirrorless camera that we use, it's usually capturing sound from all the direction, not just uh, in the field of view. So this discrepancy creates modality bias. So the, the event category that happens in audio modality is always different than the one in visual. And when we capture it, we implicitly bring that to the data set. And to kind of alleviate this modality bias problem, we propose uh, the guided loss and label smoothing. And I'm gonna just explain what each of these components means and how they greatly uh, uh, improved our performance. So the guided loss term basically means, so traditionally, if without this guided loss, um, the network will typically leaning towards whatever model that's easiest to learn. In this case, maybe the barking is very easy to learn. So it doesn't, the network doesn't learn anything visual about dog. It just learns, okay, there's a barking. So the dog barking event must have happened. That would not give us very good visual predictability. And so by adding this guided term, we also ask, okay, if you don't look at the audio branch, you just use the visual um, thing here, plus some uh, cross-modality hybrid network, can you predict visual as well? If so, that means uh, the performance, overall performance for detecting audio-visual can be much better. Then a problem immediately occurs, which is, like I mentioned earlier, not all events have correspondence. For example, the speech, it only appears in audio. If we force the visual branch to learn speech, probably inc incorrectly classify some object in the scene as uh, human speech. So to do that, to to address this issue, we kind of um, uh, applied a label smoothing in this process. So each label do not get a strong zero and one, instead it's more uh, moderate so that we can deal with this um, modality bias without introducing huge loss in the process. And here I wanna show a few examples of the typical parsing results. And first is this basketball example. Dunk. So this actually analyzed the scene because the first two seconds we see the basketball entering the ball and then we hear the, the speaker saying something that's the second two to second three and then after that is just basketball plus somewhere in between there is a, a dog dog sound here in the background you see the dog and also you hear the dog. And the second example is to correctly identify the off-screen speech. So let me play this. You know I love my meat and nuts breakfast, but it's not always ground beef in the morning. I switch it up to different types of meat. I got some ground turkey in here right now, some extra lean ground. 
So basically in the audio events, we can hear speech and we can hear some cooking going on. But visually, if you're just watching this, um, you can only see frying. So the, our model again, correctly learns this A audio and visual and their uh, intersection audio visual event. And I'll just show one extra example, which shows our model can learn, can identify the weak speech sound and notice that the speech signal is very weak. So you might need to turn up the volume a little bit to hear the speech in the background. So again, by looking at the video alone, it won't be obvious that there is a speech in there, but uh, our model correctly identifies there is um, a, a section of the video that has speech content in it. So we're very excited about the, the second level audio vi visual event parsing. And we believe our kind of um, solution to this modality bias is just fit the data set that we collected. And it will be interesting to see what other possible um, uh, ways to address this modality bias. Maybe it's, it's, it's deeper from the data sets. Before I end my talk, I wanted to briefly share about what's, what's next and what, I, what I'm interested to, to, um, to work on in the next, next years. So first is what are the, the scenarios where audio visual understanding shines? So in the past, a lot of the, the um, taggers are trained separately. Like we have great uh, VGG-ish for audio and like a ResNet for, for visuals. And I wonder as, as this weekly supervised uh, away gets more and more robust, we will train the, the embedding jointly with both audio visual at the same time. I wonder what kind of new use cases can this enable um, beyond just simple tagging. And second is um, nowadays more videos in the wild have been used as a data set. Like almost all the data sets that we use nowadays are, are videos in the wild, like YouTube videos. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, those videos usually suffer from a modality bias. The, the audio and visual events, they might not happen at the same time. Um, most events actually might only happen in one modality. Are those videos the, the best data sets? And if that's the only data set that we're gonna get, what, what are the ways to, to address this uh, modality bias? And if we want to create new data sets, how do we require this uh, audio visual correspondence to make sure our model is learning this synchrony and asynchrony? Last question is closely related to, to um, my day-to-day -day job. So I work at Adobe and we have the, the best tools for uh, content creations, content authorings. So I naturally think how would this better audio visual understanding help professionals or amateur content creation and I haven't got any uh, good insight on this one yet, but if I take a step back and think about consumption, it's still very uh, uh, basic, I would say. Um, so how we, nowadays, how do we consume audio and visual content? How do we watch videos? We use YouTube. And what kind of, what kind of AI understanding do we have in YouTube? Um, um, mostly, it's mostly just, we speed it up. And that's the only operation that we do and we skip it and we'll speed it up. And in reality, um, if we really have an audio understanding, understanding of a video, we could ask the algorithm to summarize, like for example, for example, this 25 minute talk to something much shorter um, so that you don't have to listen to me for half an hour. And, but I, think, I don't think we're there yet. What are the steps? What are the missing pieces? that can help us to get there. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. And I want, especially want to thank my uh, wonderful interns, Yang Zhou and Yapeng Tian for driving these two projects. All the paper and code will be soon made public. And if you want more information, please check out my homepage at ding.fyi. Thank you.